the fact is there's no such thing as unearned income, uh, the new uh, post-classical uh, economic said. Uh, everybody earns their income. The landlords uh, earn their income. And uh, the, the financial people earn their income by deciding who to lend to to charge money. Mm, <laughs> Well, it may be surprising to learn, but uh, students in the United States no longer are taught uh, what classical economics is all about. They're no longer taught Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill or Karl Marx or the American economists uh, or Thorstein Veblen. Uh, they're not talking about what really was the creation of classical political economy. And uh, that creation was value theory, the theory of value, price, and rent. Uh, and the whole purpose of uh, creating a theory of value was to say, what's the difference between value and price? Uh, not every element of price is actually a value in terms of cost. And uh, basically, you have a real cost of production, uh, not only hiring labor, but if you buy uh, uh, that cost includes machinery uh, and buildings and labor has to build that machinery. Labor has to construct this building. And so basically the value of any commodity or any service uh, is uh, the, the cost of producing that service. But sometimes the price is higher than that cost. And that excess of price over intrinsic cost value is called economic rent. Classical economics was all about defining economic rent as unearned income and said, uh, it's all right if uh, industrial capitalists make a profit uh, and they make a profit by hiring labor and uh, to produce uh, goods uh, or services. And they, they hire, they sell these uh, goods and services at a higher price. That's the profit. Well, they're allowed to make a normal profit. And Marx said, this is how capitalism works. And uh, uh, unlike the landlords, the landlords uh, have land and land doesn't have a cost of production. If you have a land site, the land is there by nature. That nature provides the land freely, like it provides water freely or air freely. Uh, and so there's no cost to it. But if you can say, I own this land and you don't own it, and if you want to build something on it, I'm going to charge you rent, that is price without value. That's uh, economic rent. And that idea was central to classical economics because the landlord class had said, well, our ancestors conquered this land a thousand years ago, and you have to still keep paying us the rent because you lost the war to our conquerors. Uh, and uh, we get to live without doing anything. Uh, and uh, some of us became uh, bankers and uh, bondholders. And uh, in, in Europe, they're called coupon clippers. And uh, they just uh, uh, get a free government interest uh, from the government bonds. They'd have free rents. They were called the idle rich. That was uh, the rent-seeking class, uh, rentier class. So the classical economics of Adam Smith, the French physiocrats, John Stuart Mill, uh, all of the 19th century said the aim of uh, defining economic rent is you want to tax it away. You don't want private individuals to get a free lunch or financial return or other forms of unearned income. You want to keep rent in the public sector. You can get rid of interest, uh, but you can't get rid of land rent because some locations are better. You can think of if you're looking for where you want to live in a house, where are you going to want to live? You'd like to have a home that's near public transportation so you don't have to walk so far for it. Or if there's a public school, you're going to want to live near a school or near a park or near a good neighborhood where uh, things are going on. So you're always going to have some locations that are more desirable than others for this reason. And the question is, in the United States, for instance, what makes one neighborhood more high rent and houses more expensive than another neighborhood? 
Well, the cities will build a subway near there. They're always building new means of transportation. New York City built a subway. Land rent and housing prices went way up near this new subway line on 2nd Avenue. Uh, in England, they made a new subway line to the financial district. Property prices went uh, way up there. The landlords didn't create this increase in property prices, in rents. It was the public investment that creates a good neighborhood. Public investment that provides the transportation. Public investment that creates uh, schools and builds parks. And so it's natural that the government should recapture all of this increased rental price in the form of a land tax. Suppose it doesn't uh, tax the land. In the United States, they've, uh, there's almost no uh, income tax on absentee-owned uh, property, uh, housing, or commercial buildings. Uh, com uh, pro commercial landlords don't have to pay taxes in the United States. The landlords and their bankers have taken over government to the point that it's labor that's taxed in industry, not landlords. Well, uh, what's the result of all this? If uh, you don't tax away this rent, then obviously uh, the increased uh, rental value, what people are willing to pay and able to pay or able to borrow for uh, to buy uh, this housing is paid to the banks is interest. And if you pay uh, this uh, rental income to the banks, then uh, you're uh, paying it to a financial sector that uh, is able to become a creditor class, a rentier class to get money without uh, earning it. And so in the America and uh, Europe, rent is for paying interest. All this increase in the rental value of uh, uh, homes, real estate, commercial buildings is paid to the banking class that lends money to uh, anybody who wants uh, can buy this uh, uh, housing or uh, office building uh, as long as they're uh, able to pay the rent to the banks in the form of interest. So what has happened is that real estate has become part of the financial sector uh, in the United States. Uh, and that is the one danger that uh, China should learn to avoid. You want to look at what happened in the United States and say, this is why America cannot have American labor produce industrial goods anymore. This is why uh, American companies left America, abandoned it, and moved to Asia, to China and other Asian countries, because America had let its economy be taken over by the landlord class. And that's the one thing that you want to avoid uh, if you want to uh, be competitive uh, in uh, the world economy. And that's why the United States today cannot reindustrialize unless it uh, cancels the debts and uh, uh, shifts everything to a land tax, but it can't uh, tax the land rent uh, today because this rent is already being paid to the banks. And so if you tax uh, the land rent, then the uh, uh, owner of this land, the homeowner or the commercial landlord cannot afford to pay uh, the banker and the banks will go broke. Well, uh, if that would happen, of course, the government could take over the banks and then America would have what China has. It would take over the banks that went broke and say, OK, they're all broke. We've wiped out the bank bondholders. We've wiped out the bank stockholders. We've gotten rid of a big chunk of the financial class that is uh, a parasitic class, a rentier class. Uh, and now that we uh, have, uh, the, we're taxing the unearned income, we're taxing the economic rent of land, we don't have to tax labor anymore. We don't have to make uh, wage earners pay an income tax. We don't have to, wage, to have wage earners pay uh, to uh, buy a retirement fund or a pension fund because pensions are a public utility too. So uh, uh, we can have uh, our labor working uh, as inexpensively as it would work in a socialized economy where the government uh, uh, collects uh, taxes, where the government owns the land, where the government provides education, where the government uh, basically provides uh, all these uh, monopolized services. Well, this is uh, uh, actually what uh, uh, the uh, Europe's 1848 revolutions were all about. Adam Smith and other classical economists said the center 
the main economic policy should be a land tax. And uh, Marx and Engels put that as the very first requirement of the Communist Manifesto, which was written in 1848 when all of Europe, except England, had uh, revolutions. And these revolutions were mainly against landlords and also against bankers. They were against the idle rich. They were against the aristocracy that was living in luxury while impoverishing the rest of the economy. And there was only one thing wrong with this, with this revolution. It was a great revolution. Its aim was to get rid of the landlords and bankers, but it, it didn't really protect the interests or living standards of wage earners. It's as if what the 1848 revolution was for was to make the capitalists free of the uh, uh, landlords and the bankers, uh, but not to make uh, labor free of the capitalists. And so there was still uh, another revolution that had to come, and that was uh, the socialist revolution that was uh, formulated by Marx and Engels and by other socialists later in the 19th century. Uh, but these movements failed after World War I. World War I uh, sort of uh, derailed the whole uh, logic of industrial capitalism. That seemed to be the logic of Germany leading up to World War I. It was Germany that uh, had industrialized the financial system and had created uh, what actually was a, a kind of state socialism by uh, providing pensions, providing health care, uh, providing education, uh, uh, and on the way to socialism, most of all, not letting a financial class uh, seek its own gains at the expense of the economy as a, a whole. Uh, but Germany didn't win World War I. It was the Americans uh, and the English that uh, uh, won World War I. And uh, by that time, they uh, said, we, are, we won and we won for the landlord class, for the financial class. And uh, we're we've been teaching a new economic theory since around 1890. And uh, the fact is, we reject everything that Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and the classical economy said, because if you follow their logic, where is the logic of Adam Smith and Mill and the others leading? It's all leading to what Karl Marx wrote. It's all leading towards socialism. And uh, it's leading to socialism because the fact that some income is not earned, unlike losers, and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, profits uh, that at least the capitalist earns by organizing production. Uh, it's it just given to the landlord class. Well, uh, uh, the fact is there's no such thing as unearned income. Uh, the new. Uh, post-classical uh, economics said. Uh, everybody earns their income. The landlords uh, earn their income. And uh, the, the financial people earn their income by deciding who to lend to to charge money. So uh, you have the whole idea of classical economics was turned inside out. Uh, what you have uh, since World War I is anti-classical economics. Uh, and they've... Uh, applied this by drawing a completely different picture of uh, what is uh, the economy, what is produced, what is gross domestic product, and how do we uh, create a chart of uh, the national income and product account for our country? How do we measure how big the economy is? And if you look throughout the world today, uh, the United States and Europe have sponsored an idea of national income accounts uh, that is very different from uh, what uh, the classical economists and the socialists uh, said was an income account. Uh, for instance, they count uh, uh, landlords, as ev all the land rent is contributing to product. They count uh, contributing to product. So, for instance, when uh, banks and bondholders charge interest, that's considered as uh, is income, but it's as if making this loan and paying this interest uh, is a necessary cost of production under finance capitalism. So we'll count it as part of the product. Uh, so suppose that you're a, a credit card company. In the United States, if you fall behind in your credit card uh, uh, rent, you don't make your payment on time, all of a sudden your interest charge on this credit card rent uh, goes way up from about 19% 
to uh, over 30 percent. And uh, credit card companies make more money on these penalty rates than they actually make on the nominal interest that they charge to people who pay their credit cards on time. And uh, this uh, penalty rate is called providing economic services in the national income and product accounts. Uh, financial services uh, include these penalty rates that people have to pay for being unable to pay their debt. Well, is there any cost of production to the bank of producing these services. No, the banks say, oh, you're late in the payments. We're, we're uh, changing the computer to uh, charge you the higher interest rate. That is a price of credit, but it doesn't have any value to it. It's simply a charge on the product. And if the uh, producers, if uh, uh, wage earners and uh, industrialists have to pay more money to the financial sector, that actually should be a subtrahend from uh, the uh, GDP, a subtrahend from the national product. Uh, just like uh, if somebody robbed crime, if you uh, get robbed, that's a, a overhead, that's a cost of production. The Western idea of gross national product or national income uh, is very different from what it uh, what makes sense to someone in China or someone who said, well, what's the economy actually producing and how competitive is the economy? So that neo uh, national accounting formats are supposed to describe how economies actually work. But instead, uh, the designers of these uh, national income accounts are political lobbyists for the financial and the real estate sector, the fire sector. And uh, their aim is to pretend that these sectors are actually contributing to economic uh, output uh, and growth. And uh, so the concept of unearned income doesn't appear and the national income and product accounts. Uh, if we were uh, following Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and Marx and all the other classical economists, uh, you would want to say, well, how much of this uh, income flow is unearned? How much is just economic rent going to landlords and uh, uh, monopolists and uh, the uh, financial sector is just collecting interest? Uh, uh, we want to uh, see what's the ratio between uh, the, uh, the rent seekers and the productive part of the economy. You can't tell that from the Western uh, growth national product. China would have to uh, say, we're, uh, we're not going to follow the United Nations uh, right-wing uh, pro-financial format to chart how the Chinese economy is doing. Uh, we're going to look at how China is really doing. Uh, we're going to actually look at the uh, necessary goods and services uh, that the uh, wage earners use and the, our producers need. We're a different kind of a country than uh, a different kind of an economy than the United States and Europe. And so we're going to uh, have a our own form of national income accounting. And uh, so that basically uh, is uh, the reason why the world is dividing into these two different parts today. It's uh, on the one hand, you have finance capitalism for a rent-seeking class of landlords and financiers, and then you have uh, socialism or industrial capitalism evolving into socialism in other Asian countries, uh, and uh, they're trying to uh, prevent a class from taking over the economy that uh, is created in the United States. Well, the United States keeps trying to interfere in their elections uh, to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, bankers and private the rest of the countries are trying to protect themselves from this uh, U.S. interference. Uh,